Oh, yeah. Welcome in, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. This is Cream of the Crop, a fantasy hockey podcast presented by Apples and Genos. I am your host, Blake Creamer. You can find me over on X slash Twitter at Blake Creamer AG. Also, please hit up our Discord. Uh, with the link is in the description. There's lots of action going on in there these days. And that's also where uh, we ask questions of the Discord group as well for mailbag episodes and things like that. So you can talk to all of us directly there. We can help you with your fantasy squads, okay? Um, also, if you could, please head on over to our YouTube. Uh, just search Apples and Genos. Give us a subscribe. Please like the videos, all that stuff. We do live shows there, and we post most of our episodes. Speaking of YouTube, speaking of segues... I got a very special guest here with me today. This man and his team are crushing over on YouTube with amazing fantasy hockey content and crushing everywhere else, too. This is Chris from Fantasy Puck here with me today to talk about some buy lows and sell highs. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm great, Blake. Honestly, like I'm really jealous of what I'm seeing based off the muzzy so far. I know it's November. Every year it's a struggle for me to try and get mine going, especially <laughs> competing with Mike too. Like he just blows me out of the water every single year. And I can't imagine what it'd be like going up against you on a monthly basis. But the muzzy looks good. You're looking good. I'm excited for the pod. Oh my God. I think <laughs> did, did we just become best friends? <laughs> <laughs> Potentially, yeah. You know, no one has ever complimented my mustache. You're the first, Chris. That's so insane. That. That's, yeah, that's insane behavior. That's nice. It is a bit ratty sometimes, <laughs> but, you know, I think that's that's the point, isn't it? All right. That's how we get to biz. Um, buddy, thank you so much for joining me. First off, I just want to take this uh, opportunity to say I love the content you guys are pumping out there at Fantasy Puck. It's just super high quality, but not only that, it's it's really good substance, too. I, I, uh, every time I watch your shows, I'm like, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Okay. Awesome. So that's good. But uh, I did want to just mention when I have a new guest on the show, I kind of like to just see how did you get into this? Like, like this is kind of a niche hobby that we have here. What is it like? How did you get into fantasy hockey in particular? And then content creation as well. So I think for, for me personally, like fantasy hockey is just always something that I've enjoyed doing. Like ever since like like even like into high school like i would sit down with my family every single year like we'd pick out like a fantasy roster we would do like a points only league like it's honestly like stem back that far and then in university just like with the friend group and and mike and a lot of the other fp guys like we were all kind of like super into it we were doing things like draft kings and stuff like that when it was eligible and then that kind of progressed into us doing fantasy hockey content um and so it's just kind of snowballed from there, honestly. Like it's it's one of the things that I look forward to most every single year. Just the the whole like turn into the hockey season and everything like that. Just being a huge hockey fan in general, like it's just something that I look forward to every single year. Yeah, it's so true, buddy. Did you have a did you have a particular win in a league, like one of your first leagues? Because that sort of was my situation too. I won really early on and then didn't win for like another couple of years. But I was like, <laughs> at that point, that's just straight gambling, basically. Yeah, honestly, like it, it's been the success has been pretty consistent. And I think a lot of the time it's just derives from things like knowledge and metrics and understanding like player performance, a lot of the stuff that that you guys cover when it comes to like buy low, sell highs and and understanding metrics and how to to capitalize on things like, you know, like player opportunity, production, looking at certain metrics, like I said, it's just it's a lot of uh, the more that you understand about it and the more that you're able to to learn and, and be more knowledgeable about it, the more successful you're going to be. So I always preach, I always preach with people that are like new to fantasy hockey, it's just like, just watch more hockey, just see how the players are doing, just see how often you see players being successful, right? Yeah, that's so true. I mean, you can really get lost in this stuff, can't you? There's almost like oh, for sure. the two schools of it, right? There's the um, the analytics, right? And then there's that the eye test. And, and I think both are valid, right? But uh, damn, there's not enough time in the day. Oh my God. <laughs> I, got, I got two kids over here and I'm like, you know, I get into the, all the shows and like all the, the metrics and the box scores. And then I watch highlights. And if I'm lucky, I get to watch you know uh, like two hours of hockey while yeah yeah that's like that's that, definitely but. the the biggest thing is just like finding time to actually sit down and watch and it's like that's why we like to go off metrics so often because it's just so hard to cover like every single player possible when you've got like a slate where it's like 14 games right so yeah absolutely buddy all right well we got to get the biz all right they're not here to hear me yammer on they're here to hear you <laughs> and hear about these buy lows and sell highs all right so um, you know the drill, everybody. We are going to look at last week's players here and see how they did the past week. And then Chris and I are going to give you some more players to think about as buy lows and sell highs. And then a segment we like to call the cream exchange. Join us, won't you? <laughs> 
All right. <laughs> so first off, let's let's look at the. Uh, oh, you know what? Um, we talked about this before, and I almost forgot. Uh, we should mention a little bit of uh, interesting fantasy news. Jack Campbell of the Edmonton Oh boy. Order. Yo, uh, he got sent down and it's, he got it's, put on waivers there. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Just initial thoughts on that, Chris. Um, I watched him pretty extensively when he was in Toronto. Um, unfortunately, I'm a Leafs fan, so kind of had to progress through that struggle. But like, he seems like he's just such a confidence-based goaltender. And that's when you think about it, like it's never a good thing to be a confidence-based goaltender. You always want some type of consistency in your game. Um, so with Jack, it's like the big thing is the contract right for Edmonton and it's it's the fact that you know like even if they were getting like decent numbers from him like it wouldn't be that big of an issue but they're in such a hole right now in terms of their goaltending that they have to do something and I don't think like they're in a position especially based off of what we saw last year to to give up on Stuart Skinner I think they're just going to ride him and be like this is the guy we need to kind of just like pick a goalie stick with him see if he figures it out um, and then for Jack, it's like it makes a lot of sense to put him in the AHL just for a little bit. I doubt anybody ends up claiming him unless like Tampa Bay does something drastic. But I think Jonas Johansson has been solid enough to where like they yeah. feel like they don't need to eat that contract, especially in their circumstance. Uh, and given the fact that like Vassy should be back relatively soon towards uh, the beginning of December. So I think like just for him to gain his confidence in the AHL, that should help him going forward. And I think Edmonton's just going to outright ride Stuart Skinner to, to kind of figure that out. Unless they trade for a goalie, which, you know, there's not a lot out there right now. No, not at all. But I think what you said is absolutely true when it comes to Campbell. And it sucks because this guy seems like one of the good guys in the league, right? He's a well-liked player. But, you know, if you're getting too high and too low after performances, like, yeah, it, it, there's just no consistency there. And it looks like he hasn't been able to kind of find his legs. Um, speaking on Skinner, though, and we are talking about buy lows and sell highs, is Stuart Skinner a buy low to you? Honestly, I think he is. And I know it's tough to kind of like – allocate assets or trade for a player that's just been terrible to start the season but if you if you think of things in terms of volume like i doubt that whatever ahl goalie they're going to bring up is going to be any type of significant in terms of unless he just completely takes over the net and we see something crazy like that happen but i think going forward Stuart skinner's going to get a lot of volume and regardless of whatever league you're in like that has some type of value even if his numbers aren't great right now he's a very very cheap to acquire i'm sure player or fantasy owners are definitely probably looking to offload him and I think going forward, like definitely a buy low that I would consider if I need help goaltending wise, or it's just like a, a future punt type thing, even at that sense. Right. Yeah. And I mean, common sense dictates Edmonton can't be this bad all season. Can they? Yeah. That's, like, that's, that's the thing that I'm just super confused about is like, there are times we saw it a little bit last season where they just go a week and they look terrible. And then everything just seems to be on fire in Edmonton, very similar to what you see in, in the Toronto media as well too, whenever they're playing bad, but Edmonton's just too strong of a team up and down their lineup, but it's very, very concerning some of the underlying numbers and some of the chances that they're giving up, especially the high danger ones uh, that just like are kind of got me in a, in a puzzle right now. I just don't know what's happening with them. I know, buddy. I feel for my brothers and sisters in fantasy that have some of these units on their team because damn. All right, that show ain't no good. But you know what? Uh, I will give Stuart Skinner this. The man has probably the best mustache in the league. Like, can, can I? It, what, are you with me on this one, Chris? Honestly, I think he's definitely up there. Um, Jacob Middleton as well, too, from oh, Minnesota yeah. is just right. an okay. absolute stallion. So yeah, you know these are greasy. I love that. I am very <laughs> envious of Jack Campbell's stash. That's a beautiful thing. All right, let's get to business here. We are going to just quickly review the sell highs and buy lows from last week. We'll start with the sell highs. So, um, and I'll definitely throw to you here, Chris, just because I want to get your thoughts on some of these players because see if they're still sell highs or if that window sort of closed. First player I want to talk about, uh, or we talked about last week, was Ryan Strom. Um, he did have seven points in four games the week previous, and he only had one game this last week here with no points. So there's no data uh, that really, or we're going to need more data there to really kind of get a feel on it. But everything I said last week still holds water. Like this guy doesn't shoot. He's not a shot generator, not a chance generator, right? And even though they only played one game, like it, it's just a, an example to me why I'm not interested in this player. Like, uh, you know, the game against Vegas, he played 14 minutes and three seconds just zeros across the board, right? Zero points, zero hits, zero shots, zero anything, right? So that that's kind of what, you know, the floor is for Ryan Strom. Um, and I don't know, like, what are your thoughts on the Ducks in general, Chris? And in particular, Ryan Strom, Mason McTavish, who we'll talk about a little bit later, and Frank Vitrano. Honestly, like, the Ducks seem, to whatever reason, have figured it out. 
I don't know what it is. I think I'm definitely higher on guys like Mason McTavish than I would be like Ryan Strom, for example, especially like you just outright look at his stat line. He's got 11 points in 10 games to start the season off. Like you said, not really great in terms of shot volume. He doesn't really hit too much as well, too. Really, the only kind of value that he brings is when he's producing. And you got to kind of look like his shooting percentage is pretty much on average with what it is in terms of his career. So I think in that metric, it's fine. It's just he doesn't really add too much outside of just generic production. And you have to remember, like, what happens if that kind of slows? So I would definitely be looking to sell high on him. Um, just outright looking at his stats, like, owners are going to be like, oh, he's over a point per game. He has a little bit of value. The Ducks are doing well right now. I think that's a great sell high option for fantasy managers. Yeah, for sure. And that that's the point of these segments, right? Is like, can you... Can you flip these guys for guys with a more secure role who maybe are underachieving a little bit, right? And a guy like Ryan Strome, that's a waiver wire pickup you probably got, right? You, no one yeah, drafted sure. Ryan Strome. So, yeah, can you take a waiver wire pickup and turn it into, like, you know, a player that was drafted who might be underachieving? Like, yeah, I think you might be able to. This guy's got 11 points in 10 games. What the hell? I don't understand. All right, let's move on. Jaden Schwartz is the next guy I want to talk about here. Um, the week previous, he had six points in four games and then he hit two more points in two games this week. So, you know, we can't really deny that this guy is feeling it. He's cooking with gas. All right. Uh, and he's getting points. That's great. But there's a couple things that I like about Jaden Schwartz. Um, he, you know, his deployment is what's really holding him up. And it's been a bit of a surprise, honestly, he's played, uh, over 20 minutes in three of the last five games. And that's what you want to see, right? Uh, like, it seems like a simple metric here, but you got to be on the ice to accrue these counting stats, points, and all that stuff, right? So, you know, 20 minutes and three of the last five, pretty darn nice, all right? But uh, his numbers at even strength, too, this is another thing I look at. Like, they're quite poor. Uh, he's only shooting 4.53% at five on five. And his shots to go for 60, that's leveled off a little bit to 7.67, you know, which is kind of middling, right? Um, it's the power play where Jaden Schwartz is really redlining and, um, you know, Seattle themselves, they're, they're fourth in the league in shooting percentage on the power play and Schwartz, he's, he's gone ballistic. He's shooting 37.5% on the power play. So I definitely think that's going to regress and I can't see this man continuing on uh, with this points. Although I do like the deployment. I know this is totally sustainable, right, Chris? <laughs> I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily like it's just there's it's seattle man as a whole like i just for whatever reason am not a huge fan just because of the way that they deploy their players like a lot of it is like every single guy is like getting 14 15 minutes a night and it's difficult to kind of establish yourself as having any type of fantasy value uh when you're not getting like over 17 18 minutes like there's a, a, some circumstances where i just feel like whatever line is going that light seem that night seems to be able to get the majority in terms of minutes but just them as a whole have been struggling as a team. I know that on the power play, they've seen a little bit of success recently. But like guys like Matty Beniers, who I expected to kind of take a jump and establish himself as one of the, the better forwards in the National Hockey League this year, just based off of his pedigree, was the fact that, um, you know, a lot of the time, it's just the fact that like he's had a slow start and that's kind of impacted him and along with other Seattle Kraken also. So it's just, it's kind of like a toss up for me a lot of the times with whoever's hot on Seattle. Yeah, I call them the stream team. All right, it's basically like a bunch <laughs> they are, of they do have some good weekly streams. I will agree with you on that. Well, yeah, like, but they're all just waiver wire pickups, right? It's a team of waiver yeah. wire pickups and Jared McCann, you know, and Vince Dunn. I guess you got to have him. Vince Dunn's uh, great too. Yeah, yeah, it, it's just interesting. Jane Schwartz kind of came out of nowhere, like, and, and to be able to put up these numbers here, um, it's it's a bit of a surprise, right? But really, like I was saying, the deployment is is the big surprise there. He does actually have a little bit of room with his shooting percentage to to score. Bit more at even strength but the power play should level way off and i don't trust that deployment just like he said i think you know it, you don't know what dave haxtell is going to do he's just yeah he's it's just, it's just tough player. to predict yeah like you said yeah, yeah absolutely so i think the sell high is still there for Jaden schwartz again this is a waiver guy can you flip him for somebody who's who's underachieving a little bit that maybe has a more secure role on a team that actually deploys their players reasonably shout out to dave haxtell all right uh let's move on uh ryan hartman is the next guy we had so uh, he had two points in two games this last week, uh, you know, and the week before since uh, that big explosion that he had. I think there is still some value here with, with Ryan Hartman um, as a sell high. And I would look at moving off him if I can. Uh, one of the main reasons is the kind of the deployment they got with Marco Rossi going on here. Um, he's moving up to the top line, top power play. I think that's going to cap what Hartman's able to do, really. Like he's um, he's on a 75 point pace right now. 
but that's not who this guy is, right? He's got a career high 65 points. I think 60 is probably where he lands if everything goes really well, right? And typical sell high stuff, his IPP and his shooting percentage in the last five games, pretty damn high. Like IPP 75, shooting percentage 21.4. He's not that kind of player. Those are both going to regress sooner rather than later, I think. I don't know. What are your thoughts on Hartman there, Chris? I kind of have a love-hate relationship with this guy. Like, I really think it depends on what think, uh, what you think in terms of, like, what kind of player is he? Is he the last year player where he had 37 points in 59 games, or is he the year before where he had 65 points in 82 games? And it really, like you said, kind of depends on the deployment that he gets. I think just the fact that Minnesota's, again, been kind of changing up their lineup. A lot of the times you'll see Zuccarello strictly with Kaprizov, and then they'll kind of, like, role at center, whether it's Jeek, whether it's Hartman. And then now we've seen Marco Rossi in the mix, but that top line of Rossi, uh, Kaprizov and Boldy just see, looks absolutely electric on paper. So yeah. I definitely agree that Matt Boldy's seen a significant increase in value. I want to kind of wait a little bit more in terms of sample, because I feel like if he ends up being that top center, like he's seen kind of earlier on in the season, he's kind of been shuffled around a little bit. I, I agree with you. I still think there is a little bit of value, especially in bangers leagues. Like this guy just, he is an absolute pin machine and should get you around like 60, 70 hits. So I think in that circumstance, it's a little bit different. But if we're just talking strictly like fancy points and value that he has in terms of his production and shot volume, he's very, very hit or miss. So I would definitely try and capitalize on the sell high right now. And you could probably get a pretty decent player in return if you sell it like he could be, again, Minnesota's top six center. Yeah, absolutely. I love that pin machine, or as I like to call it, <laughs> dingus. This is dingus behavior here. Um, he, but uh, yeah, he's great. He's great in those leagues. But yeah, I just, I'm wondering now that they're like, I've been waiting for a long time for them to put Cap and Boldy together. And the yeah. fact that they're doing that now with Rossi, like, that's exciting. I mean, if Hartman takes that spot, then yeah, maybe we could see a career high for Hartman. But I don't know. I think his role in the power play is probably not there. You know, we got Spurgeon coming back. I think he's probably going to jump on power play one there so some, you know something's got to give i think it's probably going to be johansson or rossi heading back down to power play two i don't know there's some weirdness going and on it's, it's not like like jeek's been good as well too like he has nine points 35 yeah. shots in the year i know like coaches don't really care how much you shoot the puck but i think in terms of pecking order you got to think jeek would slot into that top line if they don't end up liking rossi there yeah, I'd love to see that too. Oh my God. But uh, yeah, we're high. Uh, Apples and Geos are pretty high on Boldy over here and Cap is underachieving big time. So I, I'm i excited about this week with the Minnesota's good schedule. I picked up Rossi mm -hmm. in a couple spots just, just for fun. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes, but hopefully he pops. All right. Last player of the sell highs here, William Carlson. We got to talk about him. This man is still cooking. What the hell is going on? He's on a heater. Uh, he's second in the league in even strength points with 12, uh, just behind Austin Matthews. Crazy stuff. Um, and he's on point for a 95-point season. Um, all normal, uh, realistic stuff going on with William Carlson here. But uh, you know what? I, I think we have to sort of – he's going to regress for sure. But how much does he regress, right? He, he's, he's done this before, which is weird. Like seven years ago – uh, this is, seven years ago, William Carlson, I sound like I'm going to tell a really boring story. <laughs> um, yeah, he popped for 78 points, right? Remember his first year with Vegas? It was crazy. He scored 43 goals, shot 23% on the season. I mean, right now, his luck metrics are stupid. He's got a 75% IPP, shooting 26% uh, on the season, and his on-ice shooting percentage is 19. So, I don't know. He's kind of done something like like this before is this like a, every seven years william carlson like you know com comes out like from hibernation and basically just blasts off on the league like it, is this the player he is or what do you think we should expect from carlson moving forward yeah i think and i'll kind of touch on this later when we go on, uh, on towards other sell high targets but the biggest the two biggest indicators for me when it comes to evaluating a player's performance whether it's like on par with what he's supposed to be whether it's a breakout year whether it's people just drastically overperforming is shooting percentage and is average time on ice. And you look at both those metrics and over the last two years, Carlson has been below a 9% shooter. And like you said, he's currently at 26 right now, almost quadrupling uh, from the last two years. And then you look at his average time on ice, he's at 1646 right now. I'm assuming him and that third line have kind of been splitting in terms of similar ice time, but you look at his past two years as well, over 17 minutes and then over 18 minutes consistently going back to um, 2017, 2018. Yep. So I think for Carlson, just given the fact that, you know, less ice time, higher shooting percentage, definitely going to regress in my book if I had to put money on it. He doesn't really hit or shoot too much as well either. So for me, you definitely want to capitalize on the fact that he's over a point a game. You can sell him as like, 
you know, second line center in Vegas doing really well producing. They're a wagon right now. Like what's not to like about him? And so I definitely would try and sell high on him if possible. Yeah, absolutely. Get the hell off, William Carlson. Um, they do have an interesting schedule this week. They have the two games, but they're both on off nights. So Great I'd schedule hold- next week too. So if yeah, you have but- him as a streamer, then. So there you go. I mean, you know, kick tires, but if you're going to get off Carlson, make sure you're getting some value in return because this could be a valuable player for this week and for next week, right? Especially if he's continuing to pop off the way he is. Okay. All right. Let's do the buy low review. And then I want to get into these beauties, the new sell highs and the new buy lows. All right. We're going to get you some value here. All right. The buy low review from last week, uh, two players on the Predators, Roman Yossi and Philip Forsberg. Uh, We didn't have enough data basically to kind of make a make a guess on on if they were still by low so this this week should be better so Roman Yossi uh, a couple weeks ago had 1.2 games and then this last week three in three so that's excellent so um Philip Forsberg himself had two points in two games the last week and then he popped off for five points in three games this week so that's what we call the buy low bump all right, he got the buy low bump. We've done it before, and we'll do it again. Uh, but Philip Forsberg, I think that buy low window is definitely closed. But I wanted to talk to you, uh, Chris, about Roman Yossi and what your thoughts are on him this season. And if you do think he's a buy low, because something I've noticed with Yossi, his metrics are down across the board. He's not shooting as much. He's not getting as many chances. It's still early, but um, does Yossi's slower start concern you at all? So this was something that I thought about um, when we were kind of evaluating, okay, like obviously we have Makar as our number one D, who are we looking at as number two? We were looking at guys like Dougie. We were looking at guys like Rasmus Dahlin, obviously. Um, but I think the biggest thing that concerns me early on, at least in the season with Yossi, was how bad is Nashville and is that going to impact him at all? Or are we going to see something completely the opposite to where they just decide to give him the green light, very similar to what we saw with Eric Carlson the year before, where he can just fly up and down the ice at will, which pretty much what he's been doing his entire career. I don't think I'll ever be concerned about Roman Yossi, even though like his shot rate is slightly down, even though like he's not, you know, producing at an elite level as a guy like Quinn Hughes, for example, he still has a ton of value in terms of his shot volume and his block volume as well, too, if you count those as well in your leagues. But for Yossi, he's just such an absolute stud. I I just can't ever see myself being, even as a a Roman Yossi owner in one of my keeper leagues that I've had for the past three years, like he is an absolute unicorn when it comes to fantasy hockey. And so the fact that we're talking about him as a buy low leaves a little bit of a sour taste in my mouth. Any opportunity that that you could see getting this guy, I know he's 33 years old and I know that Nashville isn't an elite offensive threat by any means, but any opportunity that you can get to to be able to like acquire Roman Yossi is just an absolute no brainer for me. So I'm personally not concerned about him at all. I love that. Yeah, I'm so with you, buddy. Um, we love Roman Yossi here. I think he's he's the clear second best defenseman in fantasy. That's for sure. Just because of what you said, he does it all. Plus, um, I'm always interested in defensemen that are big time shot generators from the back end, right? And this guy, you know, last season four shots on goal per game. I love that. Uh, you know, he's he's cooking at three point five so far here, but I think that has room to grow. His ice time's down a tiny bit, and the metrics, as I said, are down a little bit. But I, I think Nashville has improved this year, right? Obviously, you know, we're going to talk about Ryan O'Reilly in a little bit, but Philip Forsberg to me, uh, that's a guy I put him on the buy low last week because I wanted people to go pick him up because I think this player is going to be huge this year. And then, yeah, he popped for five points. Um, and I think I, I like that player a lot. And I think Nashville's better this season than they were last year, obviously with Forsberg being healthy and some of those young guys that they're, they're bringing along as well. So I totally agree. Go get yourself some Roman Yossi. Kick tires. See if the uh, the fantasy manager who has Yossi's feeling froggy because this guy's going to be a unit this season. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about John Gaudreau. I call him John and not Johnny. Do you ever get sick of like... It, like his name is John. I, they just, they can't just say John Gaudreau or Gaudreau. They, the commentators always have to say Johnny Gaudreau. Every time he's on the ice, it's Johnny Gaudreau, Johnny Gaudreau. So I call him John Gaudreau. I don't know. I'm digressing. Chris, this is, this is what I do. I'm just, uh, my brain doesn't function. I'm, I'm, I'm the same way, man. It's either like Johnny <laughs> Gaudreau or it's Johnny Hockey and they don't call him anything else. So I'm definitely yeah. there with you. Yeah. Just call him Gaudreau. There's not another Gaudreau on the ice. You don't True. have to say Johnny. You know what I mean? I don't know what's going on. All right. Let's move on. Uh, so John Gaudreau, one assist in four games the week previous, and then he was able to get one goal in three games this week and a third period benching. Oh, my Lord. Um, 
So the buy low window to me with uh, John Gaudreau is still wide open. Definitely been a rough go for uh, Gaudreau in the jackets, right? But to me, he's a mega buy low, right? Um, besides that third period benching, he's still been getting great deployment, uh, just under 20 minutes a game. Production's going to come, all right? You, you got to be patient. I think this player's too good for it not to, although I do think that this is the absolute lowest point for Gaudreau. Uh, please don't show me a lower point, John. Don't do that, all right? But I do think this is going to be the floor for John Gaudreau, and I think he's a great buy low option. Um, but be prepared for for a little bit of you know frustration. It could be a stay low for a little bit while they figure it all out, right? Um, this kind of just brings me to a point like buy lows aren't really for everyone, are they? Um, they can be really uncomfortable, and you kind of have to put your faith in the underlying numbers. And they don't always pan out, but I try those those metrics. I like to put those on my side and sort of trust in those a little bit. Um, do you find yourself, Chris, looking for buy lows for trades and or, or like because I, I feel like I do it a little bit too much. I, and sometimes in some teams, I end up with like a bunch of buy lows and only fifty percent of them hit, and then I'm like, what what the hell am I doing? So I guess it really depends, and this is something that I've tried to change in my mindset over the past kind of year or so i find myself a lot of the time looking at players in buy low positions and, and telling myself man they would never trade that guy ever and then so i guess to the point where i just don't even attempt to try up for a buy low unless it's like in a package deal or i'm getting something that i really need so i've tried to kind of change my mindset and like you said just kick tires on people right and when it comes to buy lows one of the biggest ones that we've kind of talked about as a whole at Fancy Puck has been Sergachev, just because we were so high on him, especially coming into this year with the fact that, you know, if he ends up being the power play one defenseman in Tampa, he's going to have an absolutely stellar season. Uh, it just so happens that, you know, you count out Victor Hedman for a year and he comes back and, he, and it, it bites you. So uh, definitely something that we were aware of. But when it comes to buy lows, it's like you just have to have faith, right? Like you have to look at the numbers and you have to be like, look, Johnny Goudreau, 74 points the year last year. And then he had 115 in his last year in Calgary. This is a guy that produces normally at a point per game rate or just slightly below it. And the fact that he's got five points in 12 games right now is telling you that he is severely underproducing right now and it's yeah. the perfect time to go and grab them especially if you have somebody like one of our, our sell high candidates that you've mentioned where it's just like you know this player is not normally at this caliber i can move this guy for somebody that i know is an elite player and that's eventually going to produce yeah no i love that um to me john goudreau is an excellent option you know when we're looking at some of these sell highs like um you know some like I wouldn't say William Carlson, but you know, like we, we've got some sell highs. Maybe we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about some potential deals, but yeah, there's like, I like taking these sell highs and maybe, maybe packaging them, you know, as like a two for one, you yeah. know, to try and pick up a player like John Gaudreau. So Johnny Gaudreau. All right. I'll say it. What <laughs> that sounds weird. Uh, okay. Let's move on from Gaudreau. I want to talk really quickly on Troy Terry. Um, I had him as a buy low. And then he popped off for five points in two games. I love that because I got Troy Terry in so many spots and I was getting a little, I was getting a little antsy, right? But I think the buy low window is closed on Troy Terry. So I don't know if there's too much we need to say about that. I love Troy Terry as a player. Um, he's amazing off the rush. Like, I don't know if you, do you get the very, 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 I, I don't see a lot of Anaheim games. Uh, even though like they have a plethora of talented players there, like even Pavel Mintikov just looks yeah. like an absolute stud for them on the back end. And they've got guys like Owen Selwinger coming up and just the, the whole prospect pool is coming into fruition right now, especially Mason McTavish, who you said mentioned what we're going to talk about. But yeah, like Troy Terry is very, very fun to watch that whole team in general, like Trevor Zegris, like even though he's struggling too, he's just super fun to watch and see what he can do. And then you add a guy like Leo Carlson as well into the mix. Yeah. And that's just another thing to look forward to. Um, but with Tor with Terry, he's, he's very consistent, right? Like he's a lock for pretty much 60 points every year, hovers around that 30 goal mark. Good shot volume as well too, upwards of like over 180 shots. I would like if he just hit slightly more, like the fact that he's under 20 hits a game. And again, again, again it depends on your league, but um, you can't, beggars can't be choosers, but in terms of production, like I'm, I'm with you, like Troy Terry is, is a mainstay for me. Yeah. He doesn't like to hit. He's an old dancing boy. He's old cow poke. He's been doing that for years. Um, yeah. Troy Terry. Yeah, thank you for your service. Um, yeah. He, I don't know if he's going to get over 20 hits, but, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of the player there. Um, let's move on. I wanted to, I had Gustav Forsling on this list last week. Um, cause I thought OEL was going to be out with a concussion. I thought Forsling might get that power play one deployment and that didn't really happen because OEL 
you know, uh, miraculously, I guess his brain, you know, is totally fine. So that's good. So he didn't get the buy low bump there, Forsling. But he did have a great game yesterday. Um, had seven shots on goal. Obviously, we're rostering Forsling this week due to Florida's amazing schedule. Um, and then we can assess next week. But, th- I mean, this this is a guy that's underachieved this year for sure. I mean, where are you at uh, with, with Forsling this season, Chris? So I'm actually going to disagree with you, Blake. I am punting every single de- defenseman on Florida that isn't named Brandon Montour and Aaron Eckblad. Uh, ever since the news came out that they're going to be well ahead of schedule in terms of their injury, I'm trying to, if I have any ownership of Gustav Forsling, if I have any ownership with Oliver Ekman-Larsen, I'm trying to get whatever I can right now because in a month's time, I think they're just going to become irrelevant. Uh, OEL was great. Like, he got first power play. He was a good early kind of player to pick up and use and potentially use as a sell high. But again, like Forsling just has struggled and that's because he hasn't had that power play opportunity and he hasn't been capitalizing when he's been on that power play too. So for me, I just, I'm staying away from all Florida D that aren't Montour and Ekblad. And I think going forward, like those could even potentially be by low players as well too, just because they simply haven't played a game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a totally fair point. Um, I would definitely say with Forsling, like he, he's been awful this season. One of the things that I liked about this player, especially last season, is he was an amazing shot generator from the back end. Like two point shot rate was really game. good. Yeah. yeah. And, and he popped for 41 points. He had 13 goals last year in the same exact environment as he has currently. Right. It's like, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't power play one last season either. Right. So the, the reason I had him on the buy low is because I thought he might get that power play one deployment. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I think Forsling is rosterable as like a fifth, you know, defenseman kind of thing, even when Montour and Ekblad come back. And the truth is we don't know what's going to happen with those players. I definitely have some faith in Montour who we maybe we'll talk about him later, but um, I think he's going to walk back into his role, but I'm not sure. Like it, it, everything's kind of up in the air. Right. And when you have players coming back off significant injuries, maybe they don't walk right back into their regular role. Maybe they, they ease them in. Maybe their power play too. Maybe they're, maybe they have a limits, uh, min- limits minute limits uh things like that so um i don't know i'm I'm definitely i'm not punting florida uh defenseman but forsling has been a major disappointment so far that's for sure all right let's move on uh we got to talk about boone jenner uh you know any chance i get to talk about boone jenner i do uh he was (laughs) he had three points in three games since the last show he was scoreless in the four games previous so that's why he was on the buy low list um chris i've heard you guys talk about boone jenner and that always makes me happy all right i've been beating the drum for this man for years (laughs) uh as a must roster player in fantasy especially category leagues um he just does it all and i think honestly that jenner has a path to more production as well like if you look at his on ice shooting percentage right now at all strengths it's only 6.37 percent that should be much higher right and that's due to his own inefficiencies uh goudreau's inefficiencies who's been his line mate right they haven't been scoring um they just need like i expect a little bump there and and when that happens obviously uh jenner's going to get a few more points right so that said, do you have any interest in Jenner this season as kind of a year-long hold, or is he more of a streamer for you? Uh, I love Boone Jenner personally yeah. as well. I think he kind of flies under the radar. He kind of reminds me a little bit of Sam Bennett just in the fact that he is a little bit injury-prone. But when he is healthy, he's fantastic for Columbus. Very, very good, like you said, category coverage-wise. Last year, you know, great year. 45 points in 68 games, 214 shots, 129 hits, and then 70 blocks on top of that. He was a top three forward in terms of blocks with Elias Patterson and Austin Matthews. So he just does everything in terms of category coverage. It doesn't matter what you lead, what league he's in. If he's playing over 20 minutes a night, which he has been consistently over the past three years, he's just a, he's a rosterable player for me. And I'm shocked that so many people aren't on him as much as, say, we are, for example. Any time that he has any type of exposure to Johnny Goudreau, like even Kroll Marchenko, for example, or if they move Adam Fantilli to the wing, like Columbus has a lot of good, talented shooters on that team. And I think regardless of whatever role Jenner's playing, he's always going to see power play time. He's always going to see top six minutes. So I like him as, like you said, a season long player. And I want him on my team, especially in category leagues, as much as possible. Hell yes. Oh my God. Um, one of the things that got me on Boone Jenner early last season is he was pacing for um, 250 shots, 100 hits, and 90 blocks. It, yeah. You know, and he was injured, but what the hell? I mean, that that's yeah. a unicorn right there. That's like Brady Kachuk light. And for that's, sure. and, and then, you know, to see him rostered in like the 30 percentiles, like, 
this makes no yeah sense. and he he's like he's dual eligible a lot of the time too i know in a previous year he was triple eligible at one point like he's just he's so flexible he gets you so much in terms of category coverage like in categories leagues he's an absolute stud uh and if you count face-offs on top of that he's even better so yeah love it all right we're together on this boone jenner is a legend that's yeah and he he, he could probably rock a pretty badass mustache as well uh you just seems like yeah, yeah his jawline is insane <laughs> yeah it could just cut glass um i don't know where i'm going with this uh all right let's move on to our sell high and buy low segment the new players all right um and we got some beauties for you all right chris actually um why don't we start with one of yours um out of nashville there and you can talk about ryan o'reilly so again with same thing that I mentioned earlier, the two main metrics that I like to look at in terms of evaluating a player performance, average time on ice and shooting percentage. And with Ryan O'Reilly, his average time on ice is actually quite good. He's over 20 minutes. I think there is some value still to him going forward just because he's simply the number one center in Nashville right now. He's playing accordingly. But then you take a look at his shooting percentage and he's currently shooting 30 point. 0.4 percent yeah. which is absolutely <laughs> absurd like over the past couple of years he's been around like that 15 mark just simply because he doesn't shoot the puck too much uh it's just the fact that he is currently doubling his shooting percentage and the fact that he's got seven goals in 11 games like i said i still think there's a little bit of value there just with him being the number one center in nashville but i would be trying to sell high on this guy trying to find somebody that either gets me more in terms of peripherals and maybe somebody that isn't producing at a great rate right now or just somebody that's on a more uh, proficient offensive team like I think Nashville again has kind of seen a little bit of struggles early on in terms of finding consistent goal scorers we talked about Philip Forsberg that's a guy that we're really big on this year and he's the one in my opinion that kind of drives the offense in Nashville they do have some pretty good younger players as well too Tommy Novak uh, Evangelista as well too I think just with O'Reilly, given the fact that he's producing at such a ridiculous rate right now, he's a point per game player with seven goals. Um, I would just be trying to sell high on him personally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wonder what you could get for Ryan O'Reilly. Like, there's a lot of things that look good here, right? Like you said, his deployment. Um, and then if you just look in a, you know, in a bubble, just look at his point total, like that's pretty damn nice. You know, he's got 11 points in 11 games. I, I did not expect that from Ryan O'Reilly, but he certainly landed in a good spot here in Nashville, like first line, first power play. That's not what he was getting last year in Toronto, right? He was, he was getting some top six and some power play stuff. But um, yeah, I, I just think we have to take this with a grain of salt too, right? His value is being boosted by a, you know, a four-point game. He got a hattie in the last game. A Ryan first hat trick of his career, actually. Crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah. Wild. So, I mean, that's that right there. This is This is... A major sell high. This is classic sell high right here. If you can get off Ryan O'Reilly at this point, again, for someone like John Gaudreau, I mean, I don't know. Is that a crazy trade, Ryan O'Reilly, for, for Gaudreau? I mean, obviously the names don't make sense, but is that something that people would entertain? I think it really depends on your roster. Center is usually a pretty deep position. In this circumstance where I have like a pure center, maybe I'll look to try and find somebody that's dual eligible. Uh, somebody, for example, that I've been trying to target personally is Jordan Cairo. I think he's, yeah. he's a great kind of target in that sense as well, too. Historically, over a 70-point player. Plays line one in St. Louis. Gets pretty much every opportunity possible there. Uh, and then a good goal scorer on top of that. And somebody that struggled early on. I know last game he had like a three-point night with nine shots, which doesn't really help my case for being, you know, a buy low. And oftentimes I find managers will hold a player and then they'll see one big night and they'll be like, I love this guy. He's the best. Yeah. And he just kind of, it's a roller coaster of emotion when it comes to certain <laughs> players, especially early on I've been seeing recently. So that's somebody that at least I've been trying to target that I think historically as well, if you look back at his career, has typically been a slow starter, very similar to guys like Timo Meyer. Yeah, Kairou's an amazing buy low. And not something we're going to be talking about here too much, but I'm glad you brought him up because his metrics really show out. Like, um, I just kind of put him into one of our uh, sheets here. And the last five games, Kairou only has three points in five games, but he's ninth overall in the league in shots of over 60. That's amazing. And his shooting percentage is 4.6. That's not going to hold. Really high volume shooter, yeah. Yeah, so I love that. I love the Jordan Kairou take. Would you do, uh, would you try and, or do you think someone would take Ryan O'Reilly for Jordan Kairou? Is that is that a reasonable trade? Uh, 
I mean, I could, like personally, and my it depends, man. Like it, it really depends on how knowledgeable people are in your league. And I have this conversation a lot with with viewers and people that leave comments on videos and stuff like that. And people always want to know, like, oh, what's a good trade for so and so? It's like, man, it's so hard to tell. And what I what I try to tell people is address what you think is weak on your team. So if you need more wingers, I'd go out and target a winger, like you said, Johnny Gutro. If you need better defensemen, go out and try and target a D that's like kind of been struggling early on. Um, it, it's just all about trying to find the holes in your team and then being able to plug those holes with guys that are seeing early success. Love it. There you go. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about the next uh, sell high. And to me, it's going to be Mason McTavish. How about them ducks? How about I call them the mighty ducks because, you know, I was born in 1980. But, um, yeah, it's they have been mighty so far, so that's been nice. Um, McTavish is going off right now. He's got eight points in his last five games, 13 points on the season sheesh um i'm not sure anybody saw that coming but uh you know again classic sell high stuff right at all strengths this guy's ipp in the last five games 80 percent okay that's that's insanely high right that, that's not sustainable his shooting percentage in the last five 26.7 percent no he's not going to be a 26.7 percent shooter he's not andre kuzmenko all right no one is <laughs> Um, and his on ice shooting percentage, uh, 24.4%. So his line mates are obviously smashing, you know, Frank Vetrano being one of them, the guy's gone nuclear this season, but, uh, none of this is sustainable to me. I do like the player though. And I, I think I'm not sure that he's going to fall off as much as people think. Like there's, there's been some surprises here, like his ice time. I love that. Like he's getting over 17 minutes average time on ice. That's excellent. He's getting looks on power play one and power play two, you know, depending on what they're doing there. But um, there will be regression, but I'm not sure it's going to be huge, but I do still think that like when you got a player like McTavish, who's popping like this 13 points in 11 games, there's value there. And this could be the high watermark for him for the season. Right. So it could be a really good time to move off this player. I don't know where are you at with McTavish and do you think he's a sell high or is he kind of a stay high? Um, the biggest thing with me is. Uh, yes, he's overperforming right now compared to his career averages, but when it comes to players at his age, especially like the 20, the 21 year olds, like there's just, to me, there's not enough sample to really gauge what kind of player he is yet. And so this could honestly just be a breakout year for him. I Do I think he's a 20% shooter? No, I agree with you. But do I think he could be a player that hovers around that 70, 80 point mark? Absolutely. I think he's definitely talented enough to do so. But like you said, like the Ducks are just scoring at a crazy rate right now. Like they've won their last five games. They beat Vegas in regulation, the first team to do that this year. So whatever is happening in Anaheim right now seems to be working. And like you said, this could be the peak. But you do see some other numbers, like you said, like his ice times increased by over two minutes. His shots per 60 has actually gone up quite significantly, which, yep. which I like. He's gone from like a 7.9, like a low six to upwards of like a nine shots per 60 right now. So these are these are things that I like to see out of McTavish. And again, like you add the fact that he's dual eligible as well. He's a center left wing, uh, which makes him a little bit more valuable. So if you're looking to kind of, again, sell high on this player, I would completely agree with you. I think it's a good option. Do I think, like you said, he's going to completely fall off a cliff? No. Do I think, like you said, is he going to be potentially a breakout candidate this year? Yes. Like, it just really depends. It's difficult with younger players. Like, we, we one of the guys that came comes to mind recently is Seth Jarvis. We were yep. super on him last year. We're like, he's playing with Ajo consistently. We're seeing a lot of good numbers. His ice time's up. His shots are up. It didn't quite happen. And then this year, all of a sudden, he explodes. Right. So it's it's tricky, especially like in his second year, like you look at guys like Matty Beniers, for example, who I touched on earlier, is just going through an absolute slump right now. And it's like, how do you gauge this properly with rookies and younger players is the toughest decision. So that being said, I think, like you said, the best bet is to sell high on him when this honestly could be the peak in terms of his point production. Yeah, for me, I don't know about you, Chris, but like I, I definitely like safety. Like I'm not about like, I, I love this production and I have McTavish in two spots, right? I picked him up and, yeah. you know, cause Anaheim obviously has amazing, an amazing schedule season long. Right. So I'm not getting off this player right now, but yeah, it just seems a little bit tenuous to me. Right. Like for sure, if you don't see someone do something before, like, yeah, I love the breakout, but I'm never the type of fantasy manager that is trying to predict those breakouts. Like, no, that's not true. I, de I definitely try and predict the breakouts, but I, I don't roster a lot of these players. You know I, what get, I, mean? I get what you're saying. You like, you yeah. especially like you probably got this guy off waiver wire. Like he's now over 80% owned. I just did a video where he was involved. So I have all these stats off the top of my head. But like in that circumstance where like you get this guy off waiver wire, he's 
absolutely popping off right now. Really, realistically, if you're looking at it from like an unbiased perspective, the best thing you can do is sell in this guy when he's at peak value. Yeah, love it. Okay, cool. Well, let's move on to one of your guys here. Um, Chris, who did you want to talk about next? You got a couple in the hopper here. Uh, we went over McTavish, we went over Riley. Let's talk about Sean Monahan. And again, somebody where you just kind of look at stats as a whole and you're like, well, 10 points in 11 games. And like, I don't know kind of like what is going on in Montreal right now. We've seen some great production out of Cole Caulfield, which is honestly like something that we were really hoping for this year with him. As long as he stays healthy, knock on wood, fingers crossed. He should be like a 40 goal guy. But with Monahan, we weren't expecting this level of production. I know last year he had 17 points in 25 games, and it could just be the opportunity that's being presented to him. But I think the thing, regardless of what Monahan does in terms of his production, that really shies me away from a guy like this is the fact that he doesn't really shoot the puck. He doesn't really hit. He doesn't block. He doesn't do anything outside of production. We talked about Ryan Strom earlier, for example. Very, very similar player where he's just a guy that's getting top six minutes. He's producing. And that just seems to be the end of it. So if you're able to sell high on him or at least get anything in return, maybe somebody with better peripherals, like I said, maybe somebody that ends up helping your team more in defensively, you can put him in a package. Like, I think this is just a good sell high option, especially if you have him in a deeper league, for example. Yeah. Yeah. It, this guy's another surprise, isn't he? Like Sean Monaghan. I, I know actually some fantasy managers were a little bit high, like kind of as a late round sleeper to pick this guy up because there was potential. He was going to be the first line center, so definitely top six and, and power play stuff. And that's kind of what he's got. He's on, he's on power play one there and Montreal has been efficient. They've been able to kind of get some stuff done. Um, in, in the last five games here, Monaghan's got five points, four goals and one assist. Pretty damn nice. He's 82nd overall and shots and goal per 60. So that's nice. And he's 82nd overall and in, individual scoring chances for per 60. So those are numbers that, yeah, maybe I wasn't exactly expecting from this player, but you know, classic sell high stuff again, uh, IPP 83% in the last five games shooting 23.5% in the last five games. Like, yeah. You no, know, that that's, <laughs> that's not who this player is, but it's a nice story. I don't know. I think Monaghan will probably be one of these players like 50, 50, 55 points at the end of, end of the season here, but this is a nice spot for him. And I think you can absolutely jump off the Monaghan train. Um, we should talk about Brock Besser. All right. Uh, I, I was gonna, I, honestly, yeah. I'm expecting to get a lot of pushback on this just it, simply because of how good Vancouver has been. But I just like, I don't see it. Like this is one where I look at the stats. I'm like, this guy has 10 goals in 12 games. Like, let that sink in for a second here. If you think Brock Besser is going to score at a near goal per game rate, I don't know what to tell you at this point. But if you're on the bandwagon of, look, Vancouver's clicking, everything's going well for them right now. They're probably the hottest team in the NHL, maybe outside of like Dallas or somebody, for example. He has 15 points in 12 games. It's finally the year that we see the true Brock, Besser. Uh, there's just, again, it, it's not enough shot volume for me. Like typically, actually, his shot volume isn't terrible. He's around that 180, 190 point mark historically. It's just the fact that his shooting percentage is at 28% right now. And his career average is around like that 13, low 13 mark. So basically doubling his shooting percentage. And I get the hype around Vancouver and I really do. But if you think about it from the opposite perspective is his value's never been higher as a player, maybe ever, right? So for me, it's like when you have a guy this hot on a team this hot where everybody's looking at it from like the top down perspective and they're like, nothing can go wrong in Vancouver. I see the flag behind you. I know you're going to yell at me in a second here, Blake. Just let me finish. Nothing can go wrong in Vancouver right now outside of the fact that, you know, it's just his shooting percentage that really kind of scares me off. And I think you could get a pretty penny for him if you were willing to trade him away. Buddy. You're on notice. <laughs> All right. Hey, so, you know what? Uh, gotta, I got to keep it real. I agree with you. The major, major sell high, right? Uh, I've been watching this man for years and I love Brock Besser, right? You know, I love the Canucks, but that doesn't, that that doesn't change the fact that this man is redlining to a ridiculous degree, right? I've I've watched him for a lot of years. He's not he's not this player. Ten goals in twelve games is excellent, and the Canucks are you know going ballistic right now. But if you look at their team statistics, they're fourth lowest in the league in Corsi four for sixty. Fourth lowest. So, uh, but they're number one in shooting percentage. 
right? So yeah, like you, that, I'm that, assuming you watch, belt, right? Yeah, and with your experience of watching the Canucks, like what is the biggest thing that you've seen this year in terms of last year? Like I know they were solid in terms of when Taka came in and kind of took over. Like you get a healthy Demko back. Like what is the biggest thing, at least offensively, that you've noticed that's been like the number one change in terms of like at least from Brock Besser's perspective this year? Structure. Right. That that's the that's the biggest thing. I mean, you know, I've been on record saying like I, I wasn't I mean, I'm a fan of Bruce Boudreaux as a as a person, but as a coach, he was crap. Like it, he was doing yeah. read based systems where, you know, basically like, you know, do what you think is the right thing to do in that situation. Like that's not good for anybody. Right. Um, whereas talk is coming in with X's and O's. Right. OK, when this happens, you do this. When this happens, you go around here and you can you can tell these guys know where they're supposed to be. Right. And they're buying into that system. Um, so I think the coaching change has been really huge. Plus Brock Besser had, um, you know, some personal issues, like his father passed away last year yes, and yes, last like, three years. Yeah. He was dealing with like, just dealing with a sick father. Right. Yeah. So this is the first season I did call for Brock Besser to have kind of a bounce back season. I call him for like 65 points and I still kind of think, you know, maybe, maybe we bumped that up to 70, but I don't think it's going any, anywhere past that. Right. This shooting percentage is going to regress. There's no question. Um, maybe the shots are here to stay. Like he's feeling it. He looks good out there. And one of the main things that's helped Besser this season is he's been consistent on power play one. Whereas last year he was back and forth. Like um, sometimes they put him on power play two. There were some confidence issues, right? Like even just looking at his power play share last season, 51% power play share this season, 72% power play share. So right. he's getting all the power play minutes and that's making a huge difference. He's got five goals and six points on the power play so far. So half of his goals are on the power play and that power play is insane. And then yes. he has access to Quinn Hughes. Who's like, this is a player who, who I actually do think has turned a corner um, like a breakout big time. And he's already been amazing, but yeah, the, now he's in the, the elite of, of the NHL defense in terms of fantasy. That's for sure. Yeah. Front runner right now, like nobody even is close to him in terms of like, if you were to award the Norse trophy right now, like his shot rate is skyrocketed as well too. Like just been an absolute stud on the back end. I was watching him last night um, in that Edmonton game. We were talking about it kind of before the podcast yep. and man, like there was like two or three times where my jaw just dropped how, how he's able to move across the blue line, his vision as a whole, like, and the fact that you're adding like an extra, like two to three shots a game for him just has skyrocketed him in terms of fantasy defensemen. So if any of you drafted him, shout out to you guys, because that yeah, kind of no flew kidding. under the radar for us. I, I didn't get him in one spot. Oh, like, one spot. That's and I'm tough. On nine teams. So, you know, but he, he was, where was he being drafted? It was around like 70. You know, his ADP was... Yeah, like just like, like very, very similar to, to Adam Fox outside of the fact that he doesn't even block at the rate that Fox does, where it just seems like he was a low shot volume kind of like 70 point defenseman. And it's like, if you're looking at comparing him to guys like Dougie Hamilton, Rasmus Dahlin, Roman Yossi, even like the guys that are elite in terms of those peripherals and those shot volume... Like even more at Cider, I was like, I'd rather have Cider because he's going to get me yeah. 200 blocks, 200 more. hits. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but like, honestly, good for him. I'm thrilled. He looks absolutely electric out there and I'm sure you're just as happy. <laughs> yeah, buddy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am waiting for the floor to fall out a bit, but, um, you know, cause I don't think uh, first off, Besser is a sell high. The Canucks are as a team sell high, basically, like sure. if that makes sense, right. They're going to regress. But what I've seen so far this season is that that regression might not be uh, as catastrophic as maybe we would think it is. Right. And same with Brock Besser. I think he, he's definitely going to regress. There's no question about that, but does he, you know, right now he's on a, a 103 point pace. So he's going to regress yeah. down to probably a 70 point guy. Right. I think that's for a sure. reasonable regression for Brock Besser, but totally a sell high. You could get, who could you get for Besser? You could definitely get a uh, Gaudreau, I think for Besser. One, uh, one of the, one of the targets I like right now, especially if you're talking about a guy that's like hovering around a goal per game in Brock Besser's, I think you could honestly take a shot at a guy like Matt Boldy, like yeah. somebody that historically and has shown that he's can be an elite goal scorer and somebody that, that could hit over 35 goals this year, given the opportunity. I know he's missed a couple games and that's part of the reason why I think you could potentially target him really good shot rate with him as well too. But at least that's somebody where you have some historical data on the fact that he's, you know, can score over 35 plus consistently or at that rate that. at least. Besser for Boldy. Oh my God. Maybe I'll try and do that. Yeah, that's it. Um, if I get it done, Chris, I'll let you know. All right. Uh, Perfect. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe do that. I take 10% commission. Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you 11%. <laughs> just right, just fine. throw me like a fifth round draft pick or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> seems reasonable. All right. So we agree on Besser. That's good. All right. Those are our sell highs. Now we got to get into the buy lows and I got to get you the hell out of here, Chris. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. 
All right, let's get to business. I want to talk about a couple of Dallas stars here. Miro Heiskinen and Jason Robertson, both um, not really living up to the billing and their ADPs, right? That, there we got them. So I'll uh, talk about Robertson first. Uh, last five games, one goal, four assists. He is getting over 20 minutes average time on ice. So that's nice in those five games. But look at some of these numbers here. So shots on goal per 60 rank 249th in the league. What? Um, individual Corsi for 162nd and then individual scoring chances for 225th. That show ain't no good. That's not what we were expecting. Like, um, I, I play Kakupful. I don't know. Do you play Kakupful as well, Chris? Uh, the Keeping Carlson Fantasy League? No, no, unfortunately, we don't. It's pretty darn sweet. Uh, they got a nice little thing going on over there. But um, yeah, I drafted this man ninth overall there. And I felt really good about the value I was getting with Robertson. And, you know, he has nine points in 11 games. That's just not what we were hoping for. But what's really been concerning is the shot volume and the and the lack of shot volume there. Um, where are you at with Jason Robertson? And is this a guy, do you think those shots come back? And are you concerned about Robertson? Uh, I think historically, if you look at the past two seasons, he's been over 40 goal guy. And this is somebody that we predicted to be a potential, you know, 50 goal player this year, hover around yeah. 100 points again. Like he, to me, was one of the safest options in the first round just because of how consistent he's been over the past two seasons. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that like you notice with him compared to other elite players that you could take in that range is the ice time. And he hovers around that 18 minute mark, but it hasn't impacted him up until this point. And I know Dallas kind of likes to deploy their lines a little bit and, you know, throw out the third line more frequently than say other teams do. And it's never really been a concern for me. And I don't think it is a concern right now. But like you look at a guy like Jason Robertson, like like you said, the most terrifying thing is is the shot rate that we're seeing right now, and people are wondering like what what's happening in Dallas. Um, I I really haven't watched enough. Like as a team, they're rolling. I'm pretty sure they still yeah. only have one loss on the year, and that's come with Scott Wedgwood and Net Demko looks like an absolute world eater right now. It it might just be a circumstance of the fact that he's getting unlucky or he's just not getting the opportunity. And it doesn't seem like Pavelski is really slowed down either in terms of his production as well, too. Uh, Rupe Hintz recently has started to come up in terms of his point production also. So for me, like, I shouldn't be concerned. It could just be a slow start. And it happens sometimes, right? Like, this this guy has historically been around a 15 to 18% shooter. He's shooting at 7% right now. And I think he gets back to it. I really do. I can't see him being, like, even if he ends up being a point game player, he's still going to have around 40 goals. And I think, like, that's pretty good value in terms of, obviously, not ideal based off where you got him but i think it's just a slow start honestly like i wouldn't be too worried about him yeah of the nine points he has only one on the power play right which is a surprise he after he cooked for 41 power he's, play yeah he was very very good on the power play last year yeah it's interesting i was looking into i don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Corey schneider he does um uh like this thing called micro stats which are basically like chances off the rush shots off the rush uh he has like a patreon shout out to Corey schneider but um <laughs> yeah like one thing i learned from kind of being a patron of his is seeing that jason robertson isn't really a player off the rush he's more of a player that kind of cycles in gets in sets up around the face off circles and and kind of lives off his shot right so it's interesting to me that yeah his shooting rate his shot rate is way down because um yeah, it, it's I, I've watched a few games, but he's not a rush player, which I think are a lot of elite players are right. And Jason Robertson isn't one of those. And now he's not shooting. He's like a, he's a, an efficient shooter. And now he's not shooting. So I am low key concerned about Robertson, but it's still really early. It's 11 games in. Like you yeah, said, the Dallas games. Stars are um, they're winning. Right. So they can absorb a slow start with Jason Robertson. That's not an issue. Right. But I definitely. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, he starts putting together some multi-point performances and get gets back on track here. Um, we should talk about Miro Heiskanen as well. So, um, you know, in his last five games, three assists, and he had two last night. So so that's nice. That kind of bolsters that number. But his numbers haven't been great either. So um, these rankings are with defensemen only, and they're all strengths. So um, with defensemen, he's 57th overall in shots and goal per 60, 38th overall in individual Corsi 4, and 68th in individual scoring chances for. So not really the numbers that we would expect for Heisken. And this is a guy I called for probably another 70-point season, right? Um, I love the player, and I think so far this season, he's been a better actual player in reality than he has a fantasy player. Like, he's not hurting the team. He's he's doing amazing things, and the team's winning. But um, in terms of fantasy, it's been really rough. Like, only uh, seven points in 11 games. That's just not where I saw this player landing this year. Um, do, do you, is there any concern about Heiskanen as well? When when you reached out about by Lowe's, he was the first guy that I thought of. 
Mm-hmm. And and I looked and I was like, there's simply no way that, especially given the fact that he's playing over 25 minutes a night, that he's going to continue to produce at this rate. Right. And like, I know it's not the elite production that we're expecting. I know it's not like the point of game over point of game stuff. Like this is a guy that we had pegged for Norris last year and was in that conversation. I, I know it's a slow start, but seven points in 11 games isn't terrible. The yeah. really concern with me is the fact that his shot rate is down. And oftentimes when I see, like, especially with the defensive, with the shot rate being down, it's kind of like a red flag for me. Yep. Forwards, it's a little bit different because I feel like in general, they just get more opportunity. But if you're looking at a guy historically that has had 206 shots in the season, we go back to the year before, um, like that's something that it's like, okay, this is where he gets his fantasy value from. Not only is he or hovers around a point per game as a defenseman, he'll get you over 10 goals and he gets you 200 shots. This is why he's valuable. And then you throw in 100 blocks there if you count that in your league as well too. He doesn't really hit too much. But again, it could honestly it could honestly be the power play. Both him and J-Rob, like very, very similar, I guess, in the sense that like both their shot rate are down. Um, the, I'm on, the time on ice is relatively the same. So to me, that just says they're either not getting the chances that they've previously been able to produce. And Pete DeBoer is a good enough coach to where, like, he unlocked Heiskanen to begin with. Like, he was able to take yep. him and, and produce him and make him into an elite defenseman, which is what he's done with defensemen historically as a whole. So I have full confidence that both Miro and J-Rob are going to bounce back. Love it. I totally agree. Yeah, go out and get yourself any of these players if you can. Definitely kick tires. Um, yeah, I love that you mentioned uh, Heisky for the Norris. I called that last year. Obviously, it didn't happen, uh, but I was um, right in the same boat with you. I love this player. Um, so, And, and I'm, I was so happy to see him get 73 points last year. So I think 60 to 70 points is still reasonable for this player. All right, uh, we got to wrap it up here. I do have two more I want to talk about. So, And they're superstars, so we got to talk about these players and of course. see what's what. So uh, first off, I want to talk about Matthew Kachuk. Matthew, the woodchuck kachuk. Um, yeah, I, I call Brady the woodchuck kachuk. Matthew could be the woodchuck as well. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm losing creativity here. Um, all right. But, you know, Matt Kachuk in the last five games, four points, two goals, two assists. But the metrics, they're they're out of hand, right? This guy's eighth overall in the league in the last five games in shots of goal per 60, 10th in individual Corsi 4, and um, he is 19th in individual scoring chances for. But then when you go to his on-ice, uh, his team statistics, he's number one overall in Corsi 4 per 60, and he's third overall in scoring chances 4 per 60. So, um, but, he, you know, this is not we, – we drafted Matt Kachuk probably at, like – probably as high as five. I've, I saw him go yeah. as high as four in some leagues and he's only got 10 points in 11 games. Where is your concern level at with Matthew Kachuk? Honestly, like, I think it's been a slow start. Like, like you kind of mentioned, he's had four points in his last five games. Just looking at his game log right now, the past two games, he's had seven shots and then eight shots the game before that. Yeah. So he's definitely starting to shoot more. His shots per 60 as a whole are up this year. He seems to be hitting at a higher rate than last year as well. I think with Kachuk, like it's just the shooting percentage that's really kind of standing out to me. Shooting at 3.7%, historically he's been over 12, around that 15 mark. So I think it just takes a little bit of time for him to kind of get his groove going. It could have just been a slow start, for example. But you look at it, 10 points in 11 games, it's not, if you look at it from that sense, it's not really a slow start. So I think for him, at least it's just about getting more opportunity and it's just the production is going to come with him. Like I wouldn't be worried. He's one of the most consistent players in the past couple of years. He's one of the most durable players in the last couple of years. I wouldn't be worried even in the slightest right now, if you're a Matthew Kachuk owner. Yeah, there you go. But I, we know he's a buy low. Cause I don't know about you guys, but I get a ton of questions on this guy. Ton of questions on Matthew Kachuk. Yes. Yeah, like, what, like, is this guy? I think, I think over the last five games, people are, probably coming around to him but like outside of that like it's slow start like it happens with everybody like everybody was losing their mind about timo meyer everybody's you know like was losing their mind about ov too and look at him now so yep absolutely that 3.7 shooting percentage is not going to stick right that's going to get up over double digits easy and probably pretty soon here um all right and the last player we got to talk about connor mcdavid is connor mcdavid a buy low chris is it <laughs> This is this oh, actually oh boy yeah like uh, oh you're killing me man yeah I know buddy <laughs> so, what do you think tell me what have you seen with Connor McDavid this year and and then just what's been going on with him I have never in my life seen so many people ask me comments videos YouTube Discord whatever the case is like do I trade Connor McDavid. And I have the same reaction that I'm giving you right now. It's just like, I kind of just sit back. I roll my eyes. I'm like, guys, guys, this at the beginning of the year, this guy could possibly have been worth more than the second and third pick combined. Like, I really think 
that it's just the fact that Edmonton's had a rough start. People were kind of panicking about, you know, he's not looking like an absolute world eater. He's not doing outer worldly things currently. Sometimes it just takes a little bit to get back into the season. We've talked, we talked beforehand how the fact that he's been dealing with an injury, which could honest be, honestly be a contributing factor as well. But like this is this is the best player in the world. Like if you're seriously considering moving him, I don't understand why you would want to like what was your premise of drafting him in the first place? Just because he's had a little bit of a slow start doesn't mean that you go off and sell him right now. And for me, like I get it, like Edmonton is is down in the dumps right now, but this this is the best player in the world. I don't think you could ever make a trade with Connor McDavid to where you would actually end up winning the trade if you're trading him away. But at the same time, you look at it from the opposite perspective, and it's like, this is probably the only time in the past two to three years where this has been a player that's actually become available and people have been listening to trades on. So it's like, in that sense, any any time that you're able to get Connor McDavid, is you just outright win the trade, in my opinion. It doesn't matter. Like, unless you're giving up another top five piece, like you're giving up a Matthews, you're giving him a McKinnon, and then you're you're essentially like adding more onto that. Like that I could maybe see, but even like just the rate that he's been scoring at, just the way that he, rate that he's been producing at, even the shot volume itself has been ludicrous out of McDavid. And then you add the fact that he had like what, like 80 hits on top of that last season, which in terms of forwards is really hot or elite forwards in, in the sense is higher than at normal. And it's like, I get it. He's just hovering over a point a game right now, but this is a 150 point player, guys. Like let's, let's slow the roll here a little bit. Yeah, no, I love that, man. Um, and I agree with all of that. That's why, but I, but people, people do this. They trade. Uh, they Connor panic, McDavid. man. They panic. It's bizarre. And that's what I wanted to kind of point out to, to the listeners here is like, you know, people are pissed, right? Especially like what's going on with Edmonton right now. And what a debacle last night was it's, People are getting squirrely with Connor McDavid, and it makes it makes some bit of sense not to trade, but to, to but to start feeling that pain a little bit. Like if you look at his numbers, shots of goal per sixty right now uh, at even strength five or Low. five five point four seven when it's yeah. usually up around ten. So it's half, right? His shooting percentage is half. You know, he's shooting at six seven point six nine percent. Scoring chances down. Corsi four down. All, so th- there's there's legit reason to be concerned. It is still early and. Like you said, uh, th- there's this is this is the best player by far in the entire league in fantasy. Like it's not even a question. So um, it makes me think that there is some injury concerns with Connor McDavid. But still, I, I agree with you, and, and I've said this to people. We get this. We we actually had kind of an interesting chat in our Discord. Like, yeah, would you trade McDavid? And people were showing. Like one guy was like, yeah, he's been traded twice in my league already. It's like Connor McDavid has been traded twice in your league. What is happening? How do, I get, like, how do I get in that league? Like, like, I get in there and is it a money league? Up. Like, can we just, yeah, that sounds nice. But um, yeah, I, I totally agree with what you said. Anytime you're getting Connor McDavid, you win the trade, period. Right. Yeah. Um, so that said, I would definitely kick tires on this player. Go, go see what you can do. Just, I mean, just, it's, there's no harm. There's no harm in asking. Right. And I think like you look at the metrics and, and they're all low and they're lower right now and everything. And, the biggest thing for me is the eye test. Like we were talking about it the other night, especially like I'm sure you watched a bit of the game because they were up against Vancouver. But he he doesn't he doesn't look like McDavid for the first yeah. time in like two years. And the biggest like I'm still thinking there's an injury. Like there's just yeah. no indication that he's just automatically slowed down out of the blue outside of the fact that he's not 100. percent Like even the fact that the oil it's not like the Oilers have never been bad in his tenure there ever, and he's still been the most dominant player every time he touches the ice. But I think there's an injury there. I really do. He's yep. not 100 percent to me. Yeah, that makes total sense. But still, even I'll take the injured McDavid. Like, give me the injured McDavid. That's give me McDavid with one leg. I'm still never trading that guy. Well, maybe maybe not his leg. <laughs> maybe an arm. Not not a, you know he could probably do the same with one. I don't know where we're going with this. All right, <laughs> keep McDavid with his appendages, um, buddy. That is it. That's it for our sell highs and buy lows. Um, Chris, I really appreciate you being here. Um, that's super helpful for our viewers. And I definitely want to just give you the floor here and uh, promote whatever it is you want to promote because uh, you guys are crushing over there at Fantasy Puck. Yeah, so if you guys want to come check us out, our YouTube channel is a Fantasy Puck. Just all one word. Should be readily available on Twitter as well, too. Uh, we just started off trying to hit more content in terms of Instagram and TikTok. So if you guys are interested in short form content, definitely check that out. We do offer some premium Patreons uh, features as well, too. So again, if you're interested in that, check them out. Uh, big shout out to you, Blake. Thank you so much for having me on. Really appreciate it. I'm sure we will do a lot more collab wise in the future. Uh, we've got a couple things cooking up at Fantasy Puck where we're trying to get more 
creators involved and you guys are definitely on our list to start doing more content um just outside of that again thank you so much for having me again man really appreciate it buddy you're a dang legend <laughs> oh my god they're, they're just what the you know i i love what i'm seeing over there at fancy puck so everybody you got to check that out i will put um some of that information in the description as well just your youtube channel and all that uh if you haven't seen these guys you got to get over there give them a subscribe all that stuff because yeah they're, they're pumping out some really high level content so anyways that is all we've got for the show thank you so much for listening everybody really appreciate that we will be back we got a couple uh we got a live show coming up on thursday night with the rolling line boys so get your questions into the discord for the mailbag section but that's it everybody celebrate your day bye for now